that you would have cut it out by hand, maybe on the kitchen table, sewed it on her domestic sewing machine, sewed the buttons on one by one, and then put it on you to make sure the fit was good and possibly made adjustments. Another scenario is your grandmother may have hand knitted a wintertime jumper because you needed one to keep warm. And she would have gotten you to choose whether you wanted a navy blue or, blue or burgundy coloured wool. <laughs> and if you wanted one in that trendy new burnt orange colour, she would roll her eyes <laughs> and remind you that no one would probably want it passed on to them when the fashion came was over. <laughs> so we feel differently about our clothing because it's just another utilitarian product that's necessary for keeping warm, cool or modest and to meet social expectations. Now that clothing production is disconnected from the traditional domestic economy, we no longer have a narrative why or how that item came into existence. And of course, capitalism needs to keep providing us with new products all the time. The more stuff we buy, the more the wheels of capitalism are oiled, and businesses keep making profits. However, the wheels of industry have cranked up to be turning at such a furious rate that the whole system's in danger of blowing itself apart. In trying to generate more and more profits, the global fashion industry is providing way more clothes than any person needs. This is a reckless business model that prioritises channeling profits to the owners of those manufacturing businesses that will prioritise making their profits over taking responsibility for the consequences to our environment. Thousands of tonnes of unwanted but still serviceable clothing is being sent either to local landfills and shipped across the world to Africa. I've given you an overview here that the way modern people regard accumulating far more clothing than we need and the way clothing has come to be regarded as a dispensable commodity is not the way it has been. It's a contemporary phenomenon. It was never like this in the past that people threw away 24 kilos, I found out, 24 kilos of good clothing every year. It was in the past we never had thousands and thousands of tons of unwanted clothing getting shipped across the other side of the world, which is usually polluting another society uh, we're only shipping it away so that the problem can be literally out of sight, out of mind. Paul explained to us here the cost to our communities and our environment. It's a kind, it's a kind of manic addiction to consumerism that's the equivalent to ignorantly and willfully shitting in our nests. We accumulate we ignore accumulating this crap at our own peril because eventually it's going to come back to bite us on the bum. So there are obvious solutions and Deb's given us a fantastic run rundown of, about many of those solutions today and th these are mine. The most easy solution is buy less, buy better quality clothes and wear them for longer. And now this is my really key solution. If the item is still wearable but you don't plan to wear it yourself in the foreseeable future, rather than put it in a bin or donate it to a charity shop, take responsibility for rehoming it by giving the item to somebody who will value it and continue to wear it. So taking responsibility is my key message that we, we only buy things that we're prepared to be responsible for where they go on after we've had them. I'm a person who has always made my own clothes. I've done this more because I enjoy the personal creativity and self-expression it allows me, not because I have any interest in so-called fashion. Frankly, I describe myself as an anti-fashionista. My solution to rejecting the wasteful business model of overproduction has been to reframe my attitude to the items in the waste stream. I've come to view the waste stream as an absolute El Dorado of affordable resource that provides me with stuff that is eclectic, quirky and unique to work with. There's no shortage of high quality goods 
I constantly discover fabrics to work with that are wool, silk, cotton, linen, and every kind of mix. Uh, referring back to something Paul said, I'm not a fabric snob when it comes to upcycling either. I will take synthetic fabrics, mixed fabrics, and remake them because, in my opinion, if they're already existing in the world and they're nearly in the waste stream or are yes. in it, yes. I might as well yes. recirculate them so that you know they're not going into the ground and the atmosphere. I stopped buying new fabric and turned my studio production completely over to using only upcycled fabrics about five years ago. In the beginning, I was mostly remodeling existing clothes, but at, some of you may have noticed our local village oh, shut down. Yes. And so I started playing around with furnishing fabrics a lot more, such as curtains, bed sheets, duna covers, tablecloths, upholstery yeah. offcuts. And now I seek out and collect these mainly. I alter the fabrics by dyeing, stenciling, screen printing, free painting, patchwork, applique, dozens of other textile art techniques. Uh, and I find that using these flat, large flat metrages of fabric are actually easier for me to alter, obviously, yes. than trying to remake yeah. existing clothes into different mm -hmm. versions. So I bought some samples here today of my work so that you can see that uh, the things I make are you know, quite eclectic, <laughs> quite interesting. Uh, I also, oh, there are a lot of people that regard the way I alter fabrics as literal, literal artistry. So I'm very proud to say I've had a number of exhibitions and many of the places I sell to in Newcastle are actually art galleries. So everything I make is unique. There's no manufacturing, there's no mass production. And here we go, this will be something you're all familiar with. I've just oh, used cool. the tops, you know, of those Jeans and would that fit me, Pearl? Uh, quite possibly. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, and that great? there's a great oh, deal of um, stenciling is one of my main techniques, and I also love to do these running stitches, um, similar to the Japanese art of Shashiko and Boro. So you're an absolute treasure, Paul. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah and you're an absolute treasure. Oh my goodness! Made from bed sheets oh, and wow. embellished with little bits of my <coughs> textile artistry, appliqué, that's, that's and more run and stitches, and yeah. So and it, of course, everything, hundred percent, all of this stuff has been waste fabrics. Do you the quilt one, the one we used in the doona, doona cover? Uh, this yeah, one? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, oh, this is a gorgeous thing. I mean, I'm at this well. Duna cover, which is actually, <laughs> this embroidery is all cotton, absolutely exquisite. Oh, oh my goodness, it's lovely. They're just works of art. They are. And it's all lined with a cotton sheet, that beautiful purple cotton sheet. And of course, oh, oh, you're amazing. the furnishing fabrics, like everybody has to have sheets and Duna covers. There's just a, as much a massive quantity of that going into the landfill as unwanted clothes. And I'm often appalled to discover many of these sheets are in absolutely pristine condition. Yes. Like some of them are still literally unpackaged. Um, this is one of the more, more complex articles I've made. This one is one of the unsold garments from my That's exhibition funny. in 2020, which was called 30 coats. 30 coats. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. Pearl, Pearl made them in the lounge room at home. <laughs> <laughs> the sewing machine. He's, he's like, Do you mind if I turn the TV up so I can hear it? <laughs> it <laughs> over, over, about, over about three months. Oh, I have seen you today. I published a little book about um, all the coats that I've had in the exhibition there. So and I named the source of the fabrics that I've used, you know, what, what I've remade them from, and the textile art techniques I've used. So uh, I have that for sale down there. It's $20 and full colour. And if you go to Pearl's website, pearlredmoon.com, oh, yes, you'll, yes. you'll see the exhibition in, live on yes, video. I, I, <laughs> I have a little um, 
piece of paper down there if you would like to follow me on Instagram or um, <coughs> such places as that. I now have a YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah so I have a YouTube channel. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 so, there you go. We can we can master it, I tell you. Um, so in my studio when I'm working, I actually now have a video cam above my work table and I um, record when I'm working, when I'm uh, stenciling or screen printing or stitching or cutting out or patchworking fabrics together, I record that and put that on my channel where I advocate for people to be reusing and remaking textiles and I hope to inspire them by what I do um, to follow my example and use upcycled fabric. This is the latest thing I made. I made this just a few days ago. Oh, nice. Now this fabulous cotton I bought next door at Murundi Treasures for a dollar. Mm -hmm. it, it was obviously white. And then I was I described in my YouTube channel how I was in a very bad mood that day. So I just literally splattered it with paint. <laughs> I assaulted this piece of fabric <laughs> so that the dog wouldn't get it in the head again. <laughs> and you know, and then I also printed this green fabric which is a sheet and you know four hours later da -da, we have oh, this jacket yes. all lined with sheets so you can actually if you go, do go to my youtube channel you will literally see over two or three 12 or 15 minutes videos the making of this right from the beginning to this finished garment so you use like vegetable dyes and things or no no just um, fabric just don't paint, yeah, yeah. Uh, fabric paint stencil Fabric uh, screen printing inks. Yeah. yeah, they're freely available, and I talk about that on my YouTube channel too. I've got Mail in Sydney, Hydrotex Permacet, and um, yeah. So I just want to show you, like, this is a, another piece of textile that I literally stenciled yesterday. Okay, so uh, I'm going to use that in conjunction with this fabulous vintage piece oh God, that I bought. This cotton. I bought that in Tamworth a couple of weeks ago for three dollars. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> oh, but I tell you, it's so exciting. Now, oh. these are, I've just bought bits and pieces of stuff that I just collect. Like, there's a lot of black and white in here because I love to put paint on them. Um, look at that gorgeous piece of uh, applique there. Um, yeah, so. You know, these doona covers, us I usually pay around about 3 to $10. Mm -hmm. And so often they're a cotton mix, just as often I find linen, pure cottons. And these are furnishing fabrics, so they're really durable. They've been made for wear and tear. You know, they can be refashioned into clothes and, and last absolutely ages, depending on how well the owner looks after them. And then, of course, there's also the fabulous vintage textiles that can be recovered. This beautiful cotton tablecloth mm -hmm. purchased just yesterday from Marundi Treasures for a dollar. Pat gets really good fabrics in there. I often buy, get real treasures down there. And, of course, your classic um, retro bark cloth. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So... All of these it things. Those all the orange jumpers that she did. These unique, eclectic, wonderful fabrics. Yeah. Uh, they're just so good to work with. You know, I, fabric remnants, like from people's stashes. You know, I find these kind of things. Uh, I can guarantee I cannot go into a thrift shop mm. without coming out. With a bundle of marbles. Um, like per Pearl loves her fabric so much that she, that she kisses them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, this like this morning, she was getting them out and. Oh, <laughs> well, Pearl, you pick those up and you just bring them to life uh, with your enthusiasm oh. and, your, and, and you just make that sing. You know, I mean, look at these two together. Yes. Immediately, I want to make them into a coat. <laughs> They're married. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost married. And, and, and Rodney's correct. I'm passionate about fabric, about textile. Yeah, it's yeah, it's something I've been like that 
all my life. Um, and I just, unlike the other lady who said that her family were too upper middle class to, to buy from thrift shops, I've shopped in them all my life. We really. come from a very working class family. And when I was 14 or 15, mum used to give us what seemed like a lot of money, 10 bucks a week, but we had to buy our own clothes out of that. Oh my. Yeah, which was a bit rough back in like the early 1970s. So I started shopping in thrift shops. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The stuff yeah. you could find back then, I mean, it was like oh, the, the, the generation that before us, it would be the ladies from the Second World War who were dying off at that time, the fox fur coats and uh, just, and I even once actually found an Emilio Pucci silk dress, which, uh, when I was about 18 when I found it, I thought, this is weird, this dress is all hand stitched, and it's silk, and it's like, and the label on it, like, it meant nothing to me, like, around about 1975, I didn't know who Emilio Pucci was, <laughs> but he's an Italian designer, but, yeah, so, like, it was those early years shopping as a teenager, that I learned the absolute buzz, the, the thrill of finding exquisite things uh, in thrift shops. And it's no different now. You, you can go in there and discover the most fabulous things to work with. So, you know, I understand that people sometimes feel a bit icky about it. Uh, <laughs> you know. Get over it. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> Do the right thing, you know, and and honestly, if you're a creative person like me, there's no better resource. I, I described in my speech there, it's an El Dorado, it's an absolute gold mine to me. I, I'm just, I'm like, I'm like a crack addict. Visiting my dealer, when I see him in the shop, I walk in those doors, I'm like, oh. You know, because I know I'm about to get my hit. <laughs> so this is just obviously a tiny portion of my... Um, I'm afraid I have to acknowledge I am a bit addicted to collecting. Um, Fab fabrics. Like You're in months free. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> one day when, I, when I'm passed on to the big fabric shop in the sky, I'm hoping that I'll be able to auction my massive collection off and maybe donate it to the CWA or something like that. <laughs> I'm sure people will come from far and wide to see the marvellous things I've collected. <laughs> Oh, oh, thank you. Any questions? No, good. Well, what time is the shop open? <laughs> <laughs> it's open sometimes. <laughs>